have this room full of people. I'm Julie White, I'm the Deputy Secretary for Multimodal Transportation, and for today's purposes that means the Rail Division, which is one of my uh, units that I work with. Um, we always start every rail meeting with a safety briefing. So here we go. We are located in the Renaissance Center at 405 South Brook Street in Wake Forest, North Carolina. Should there be an emergency that requires an evacuation, exits are located to the stage left for the audience, at the back of the room toward the parking lot, and through the back of the building by the restrooms. The doors near the bar lead to internal offices, which have external exits if needed. Upon evacuating the center, the rally point will be the grassy area at the corner of Brooks and Elm, located in the back of the parking lot. Eddie McFalls and LaVonda Norman uh, have the list of in-person attendees, the sign-in sheets. If you have not signed in, please do so, because that list will be used to verify that you made it to the rally point. AED and first aid kit are in the bar area. Uh, Brett Gallagher is designated to get them in the event of an emergency. Fire extinguishers are located around the room, as well as fire alarm poles in the event of a fire. There are possible tripping hazards in the room, so please be mindful of them and keep our walkways clear. Several attendees are CPR certified in the event of an emergency. Ron Lucas is designated to call 911. John Dees is his backup, and if in the event of an active shooter, we will follow the FBI's guidance to run first, if that option is not available, hide, and then fight as the last resort. So I feel like I should like be doing like airline attendant moves, so you know where all those are, um, but I uh, wanted to make sure we covered our bases with that. And with that, I would like to introduce Wake Forest Mayor Vivian Jones, who is so kind to host us today. Thank you, Julie. Welcome to Wake Forest. We're really glad to have you here. I can't tell you how excited we are about this project. We, I, I see this as something that can definitely be transformational for our community. And I'm always ready for that. So thank you for being here. I can't wait to see you working out here in Wake Forest. Thank you. The mayor is one of the biggest champions of this project. She has been cheering this group of cities and counties for, gosh, I want to say almost two years now, Mayor. Um, so we are so fortunate to have her leadership on this project. Uh, so I want to be sure and welcome our partners today that are in the room. We have folks from the Virginia DOT, from the Virginia Passenger Rail Authority, from Amtrak, and from the Federal Rail Administration. Um, we have a number of folks here today from the North Carolina DOT as well. Um, I cannot recognize them all, but I want to be sure and do a shout out to our Deputy Chief Engineer, Lamar Sylvester, our Division 5 Engineer, uh, Brandon Jones, and our Office of Civil Rights Director, Tanya Smith. Um, we do everything at the DOT in partnership. It's one of the things I love about working there, and I appreciate our Department of Highways partnership with us on this project in particular. I uh, also want to recognize our city and county partners on the S-Line vision. The town of Apex, the town of Franklinton, Franklin County, the city of Henderson, the city of Raleigh, the city of Sanford, Wake County, the town of Wake Forest, and Warren County. Uh, I talk a lot at the DOT about our secret sauce. So, you know, you work there long enough, the highway guys teach you the secret sauce. And I have learned it, and it's all about partnership with the communities that we serve. And these communities have provided local match in every grant we've sought. They are skin in the game on this project, and I think that's part of that winning secret sauce for our winning grant formula. So I cannot thank them enough for demonstrating their support for this project by putting their own local funds in it. Um, I am really excited to see so many people in this audience as we move through this next milestone in our vision to bring the Seaboard Rail Line into public ownership and reestablish passenger rail service on it. We plan to grow our wildly successful passenger rail service that currently runs from Charlotte to Raleigh north on the S-Line to Wake Forest to the communities beyond, better connecting rural and urban parts of our region and then further to Richmond, connecting us with our partners in Virginia, cutting an hour off the travel time between Raleigh and Richmond, and creating that missing link between the Northeast Corridor and all points south. Post-COVID travel patterns have changed, 
And what's really interesting about them is we've seen incredible growth in ridership on the Piedmont and Carolinian. We are already back to pre-COVID numbers and beyond. Um, we're running among the most successful ridership of state-supported rail service in the country. And if I don't say that, every time I talk, Jason would be incredibly disappointed that he hadn't taught me that well. Um, we are really excited to add the fifth frequency between Charlotte and Raleigh next year and move our station into Uptown Charlotte next to Panther Stadium. We think with the introduction of those things and our new trail train fleet, our ridership is going to soar to even new levels. The cities and counties are prepping for this project. They are doing transit-oriented development plans with us that will complement their already walkable downtowns. They're planning for mobility hubs, which will provide both the rail station and the last mile solutions so that we can have more walking, biking, scooters, microtransit, transit, all of the options available to folks who come off the rail. More foot traffic in downtown and more housing in downtown creates more business opportunity and more economic growth. Mixed use development with retail on the ground floor and residential and office above offers people the opportunity to walk for their needs. And with our governor's two executive orders focused on creating a clean, equitable economy, changing the way people live and move is key to achieving those goals. You'll hear today from our Office of Civil Rights as the grant we are discussing aims to ensure that we maximize opportunities for small and disadvantaged businesses. The modes enjoy a really strong partnership with our Office of Civil Rights, and we really appreciate that they have been engaged in this conversation with us for going on two years, and now the rubber meets the road, and we get to really put it into action and that partnership become real. The Raleigh to Richmond corridor has been decades in the making, having already been through NEPA and having a record of decision. Given this status, it is uniquely positioned to take advantage of the historic levels of rail money made available in the bipartisan infrastructure law, while we are here today to focus on the Raleigh to Richmond PE grant, know that our team has been working for months with our partners in the room toward the discretionary opportunities available this fall from the Federal Rail Administration to bring this project through construction. Jason's going to talk more about that, but we want you to know what we're talking about today is just the start. Bringing this corridor into public ownership and reintroducing passenger rail, building the mobility hubs, creating the transit oriented development is a generational opportunity to connect our urban and rural economies, grow all of them in ways that reflect their individual character, and improve the lives of the people who live there. We have an ambitious shared vision for this project and an aggressive timeline to achieve it. And we can only do that with you, our industry partners. We want you on this team as you are going to help us continue to demonstrate to our funding partner at the Federal Rail Administration that North Carolina can deliver this project on time and on budget. We need you to bring your innovative ideas, bring your solutions, and bring us your very best talent. And I say welcome to the team. So with that, I am pleased to welcome to the mic our partner in Virginia, Mike McLaughlin. Thanks, great crowd here. Um, is the mayor still here? Mayor, Wake Forest holds a special place in my heart. Uh, you probably don't know this, but I was down here June 2nd for the uh, Chrissy Grant announcement for, for the a pub, a preliminary engineering funding, and I think Julie knows what I'm gonna say. We had a meeting shortly thereafterwards um, with uh, North Carolina DOT, Amtrak, and the FRA, and I got a call in that room that my sixth child was being born. So I did make it back to Richmond in time, so every time I come here, I have good feelings. Hopefully, I don't get that call again because that was just a, that was just a couple months ago, and um, or nothing bad happens. But uh, so so Wake Forest is a great town, and always happy to be here. Um, so on behalf of uh, Executive Director DJ Staller and our Board of Directors, thank you for having us here. Some of you might not even know who we are. We're only a couple years old, um, but I do want to introduce some some folks who are here in the room. John Carney, our Vice President of Engineering and Construction. Uh, Jeremy Latimer, even though I asked him to sit up front, he's way in back, he just waved. He's, he's doing work, that's good to see though. He's got his laptop open. Uh, John Kostinuk, John's, John's back there as well. A colorful character, not only in dress, but in other ways as well. Um, and also I think listening, maybe possibly listening online, are Fyatt Constantine, uh, Kate Youngbluth, and Charlene Cleveland. Um, these are, we have a lot more people that I could name but um, it's even dangerous naming one person because I know I'm probably leaving a lot of people off the list. But I'm only up here because of the work they all do. 
Um, I'm lucky enough to be up here to represent VPRA as a chief operating officer. Um, so happy to, some, some folks have been around a few years and some other folks have been around a few months, but even though it seems like, for better or worse, John, longer than that. Um, so, uh, so I'm sure you've already, some of you already met some of the folks here in the room, but uh, we'll be around for a little bit to, to talk with you afterwards. And if you need to come see us, um, please do so. Of course, if we have a procurement out there and you want to talk about that, that'll be tough to do. But speaking of which, a couple quick announcements before I, I get into this. Um, we will have our, an industry day of our own on September 17th, and we're also having a pre-proposal for Long Bridge on September 7th. Uh, both of them are Richmond and both will be in line as well. Um, so with that, I, I'm going to get to my slides real quick. Um, and by the way, if I call Raleigh or Richmond or Richmond or Raleigh, forgive me. Um, I think you know why. I, I just I think about <laughs> Richmond first. Um, so for those who don't know, we have, we have had a few industry days. We had one back in the spring, so I'm not going to spend much time on the projects at all. Um, this is Jason and, and Julie's day, so I'm going to leave it to them. But uh, this is, we have a lot of public information on our website. We have undergone a lot of negotiation with CSX and Norfolk Southern over the past few years. And in doing so, as you see from my notes, I'm not going to read all the, the what's on the PowerPoint. Um, we're 400 miles right away, over 250 miles of track. And we're not buying track just to buy track. We're buying track to lay track next to it, actually. To upgrade track and to lay track next to it. So that's a lot of the right of way. Actually, from Richmond to Petersburg, we're getting half the right of way. Sorry, DC to Petersburg. We're getting half the right away. CSX is retaining half, most most of the half of the tracks on it, unfortunately. And we're getting the, air, the the half either has a third third track on it or room to build other tracks. Uh, we also have some quarter preservation on what we call the Bucking and Branch from Doswell to Clifton Forge, and I don't want to forget about New River Valley, Roanoke to New River Valley. That is uh, a negotiation we had with Norfolk Southern uh, to add a second train to Roanoke, and. Um, to extend from Roanoke to New River Valley, where Virginia Tech is. Um, it's actually a growing area down there. Uh, we have a few hundred million dollars worth of projects down there as well. I should mention, since I mentioned the second Roanoke train, rail ridership in Virginia is for Amtrak is at record levels. 110,000 plus rail rides in July on state-supported trains in Virginia alone. That's not just because we added trains. Actually, even the routes where we didn't add trains saw an increase. We're, and, and, and ridership was going up before we added trains in July to Norfolk and Roanoke. I was going to every month from April to May to June, and we've surpassed the pre-pandemic levels. So it shows you there's a need. I gotta be honest with you, a couple years ago, a lot of us were worried. Are people gonna get back on trains? And emphatic, emphatically, and you've seen it in North Carolina too, people are getting back on trains. So our work is, is more important than ever. Um, and as Julie said, we've actually built a great relationship, I think, the last four or five years. Uh, think how far we've come the last four or five years, uh, from when hoping there might be money one day to now uh, Virginia having a, a $4 billion plan along the RF and P, which I'll get to in a second, and a few hundred million dollar plan with Norfolk Southern, and then the IAJ money that's out there, um, the bipartisan infrastructure money. We've come a long way, and we need all of you as, in the industry to help us get to where we truly need to be. So next slide, please. Sorry, do I have it? Okay. Thank you. So I'm not going to quiz people on this because there's a lot going on. The point is there's a lot going on. Um, this is the DC to Richmond section. We have definitive projects with CSX that we have to deliver. Actually, they're helping us deliver as well. Uh, mostly focused in the DC area, uh, DC to Northern Virginia. Um, and, and we've been working North Carolina for a while, and I think they, they'd agree there's, there's two keys to unlocking the connection from Northeast to Southeast. One is this Northern Virginia area. There's only two tracks to go over the Potomac. All passenger trains in Virginia that includes the Carolinian trains and the long distance trains, travel over the Long Bridge. And it's two tracks. Also, VRE trains, um, eight from the Manassas Line round trips, really 16 from Manassas Line, 16 from Fredericksburg Line, travel over the Long Bridge. So as you can imagine, it's congested. And CSX uses it as well. Um, so that's the first key. I think the second key to unlocking this is Richmond to Raleigh. Um, and Jason's and group have some great slides they'll show later that show that picture is worth a thousand words, so I'm not gonna get into it, but we're excited to work with um, North Carolina on not just, not just the projects down south, but we're a team. They helped us with, we needed some federal legislation, reached out to Jason, he made some calls to his delegation, and they, they put in a good word, which really helped, because they knew that if we don't get Long Bridge built, and the projects North Virginia built, the Carolina trains are gonna get stuck. 
They're going to get stuck in Northern Virginia on the way to D.C. because there's not enough capacity up there to run all the CSX trains, all the Amtrak trains, all the VRE trains that we have up there. So while we do want to get to Ettrick, Ettrick is the Petersburg station, as fast as possible, I think we all know there's a key to getting even further north because we don't want to just put trains out there, whether it be North Carolina or Virginia, and have them get stuck in 20%, 30% on-time performance. We want that on-time performance to be above 90%. We need help from the freight railroads to get there. But the good news is we control a lot of our own destiny. I mentioned purchasing track. Once we have a separated corridor, we have enough room for much of this corridor to build up to four tracks. Two will be for freight rail, two will be for passenger rail. We can run more trains. The trains that they're going to show you that are currently running North Klein that we can push up there, we can get the, the Charlotte trains, the Carolinian trains, the other trains up quicker to Richmond and up quicker from Richmond to D.C. So I'm not going to go into any, any more detail. Uh, the, I think a lot of you do know that the, um, we call the S-Line from the Petersburg area to Ridgeway North Klein as abandoned track, um, which has some complications, but also some fun challenges. Um, and then I think they'll go into the, the track, which, which is what, not even two blocks away from here, that is active track. So we have some challenges down there. Uh, as you see in the lower left corner, the segment two, as we call it, um, that's the, the S-Line from Petersburg to, to North Carolina. Um, that's something we look forward to working with uh, North Carolina and our partners at VDOT as well, as well. So I don't have much else to say. I think I went over my own five minute time limit, but I'm gonna stick around as my team will as well. Happy to answer any questions you all may have. John, did I forget anything? I got it, okay, okay. Thank you everyone. And next up, um, my good friend Jason Northner. Thank you, Mike. Um, I, I can't say enough about the partnership with uh, Virginia and VPRA. They have been um, tremendous uh, partners with us. Um, they've actually been kind of big brothers uh, to us in a lot of ways because uh, a lot of what, um, a lot of the catalyst for where we are today was kind of led by them. Julie and I actually went down, or went up, I should say, up to uh, um, uh, um, the southern part of Virginia to meet with Virginia about in 2018 and uh, right at the time right, that was right at the time that they were announcing moving into this this major phase of transforming rail in Virginia and uh, that program really set as a catalyst you know kind of where we are today as partners in this I also need to mention uh, and another important partner in this effort is Amtrak um, in last year many of you may be aware that uh, they released a a national map showing the expansion of services that they were envisioning uh, for a 2035 time frame and one of those major elements of that map is this new connection that we're going to talk about today uh, from Richmond to uh, Raleigh Raleigh to Richmond R2R is convenient for from that perspective um, but yeah that that um, that Amtrak as an important partner is as well and, and being a catalyst and also an investor uh, in this effort is a is a major component of our success as well And I'm going to slide this just a little bit closer to me so I can see it and attempt to use the clicker and not have technology get in my way All right, this seems to be working so far. That's good All right, the story of this line goes back to uh, really um, the 80s uh, when CSX chose to uh, as Mike mentioned, abandoned a portion of the S line from Petersburg uh, down into North Carolina to North Carolina and favor moving all of their freight services, all their through freight services, over to the A line, which operates uh, to the east through Rocky Mountain. In 92, the USDOT uh, announced that uh, they would be designating uh, higher speed or higher performance corridors throughout the country. And this segment here, uh, the southeast corridor of the southeast corridor, which connects D.C. really all the way to Florida through uh, six or seven states, um, the S line, the Raleigh to Richmond piece, is a major element of unlocking that region of the uh, the country. It's a significant project uh, for a lot of reasons, but one thing we know is, especially if you're from this region. Um, or even Richmond, for that matter, uh, or, or other areas, is that th these areas are growing significantly. Population is, is increasing uh, by leaps and bounds. Um, 
we have today uh, by this map from DC connected down to North Carolina about 20 million uh, people that are connected um, that could be connected better by a rail system and that number is expected to go to 25 million uh, by the year 2040 what we're looking to do as Julie mentioned was create a system that creates additional capacity improves speed and really makes passenger rail a very relevant and critical component of the path of the um, inner city travel market and interstate travel system we're creating a backbone of a regional multimodal network where the rail system basically connects our urban and rural centers together um, with, a, with a network that really functions for our citizens, especially those disadvantaged communities that do not have ready access to vehicular transportation. So there's a lot of benefits to this, but what we call this, this piece of the quarter is the missing link in the network. It connects the very successful Virginia services that Mike just mentioned to a very successful and growing North Carolina service um, in, in our region and ultimately to the, to the entire Southeast. A couple of the bullets here are important. You know, we're talking about a new advanced corridor that's 110 mile an hour capable and possibly even higher than that. We're connecting manufacturing centers and job centers together and possibly over even longer distances. Our travel uh, market, our ridership is way up. We're showing that there's demand for these services uh, for folks to travel uh, these, these distances, even regionally. Uh, we're reaching 42% of residents along the corridor that are historically uh, underserved uh, that could benefit from this enhanced access. Um, we're creating new north-south freight capacity by growing passenger service on a corridor that, can, that is freight and passenger capable um, to withstand uh, natural disasters, major maintenance activities, or other events that can happen on the existing rail corridors. And we're providing an equitable transportation option and improved quality of life for the full, full scope of the, our citizenry. We're meeting the, um, the, uh, the expectations of the governor's uh, executive orders 80 and 246. Uh, North Carolina's transformation uh, to a clean, equitable economy by attracting riders to rail and other modes, uh, to rail from other modes and, and rebalancing the modal system. Uh, the diverted cars along with buses and air trips would reduce air emissions with the fully connected system by 3.6 million metric tons of carbon, 10 million metric tons of NOx and 237 metric tons of applicable a particular manner and 31 metric tons of SO2. It maximizes safety on the quarter for growing passenger rail service. We are avoiding 187 crossings by this new quarter through great separations. And it creates opportunities for TOD and economic development in all these communities. And I'll go over that in a little bit. And then importantly, it creates a short, shorter route, a more robust route, one that folks will use for inner city rail service, avoiding congestion on the very important freight corridors that also um, serve our state and serve the region. So I'm going to step through a little bit of the service development sort of concept here uh, that we are uh, developing as part of this project. Today we have two very successful systems. A Raleigh to Charlotte system with high frequency service via the Piedmont and Carolinian and the Virginia service which has frequent service between the Hampton Roads area, Richmond and DC and on, on, on up, up north. In between them is one train a day, the Carolinian, which operates one is one of the most successful trains in Amtrak system, but it's only one train running over a very circuitous route that takes too long and doesn't have the capacity needs uh, or meet the needs of, of our citizenry for uh, service throughout the day. By 2020, in 2023, or 2026, we will have started to see the implementation of elements of this, of this system with existing funded programs. Virginia is working on adding some additional service from the Richmond area north. Uh, and we are, as you may be aware, working on the Charlotte Gateway Station with our partners at the City of Charlotte to put that project in place as well as a new maintenance facility for the, for, um, the new vehicles that will be coming to the system in the 2026 timeframe. Aggressively, we are looking at a 2030 concept with this project that will deliver the new connection between the Triangle area and Richmond 
or, or and, and Ettrick specifically in Petersburg, to create that new connection where we can start to tie to the Virginia services and other services as they, as they go north with high frequency service throughout the day. And connecting the, uh, the important work that we've done on the North Carolina River Corridor as well. And then by 2040, we're looking at a high frequency, fully developed system with all the, the network po uh, points fully developed, including the program that Mike was mentioning in Virginia uh, to add significant capacity between Richmond and DC. We've accomplished a lot on this project. I mentioned the 1992 designation of the corridor, but in 2002, we had already finished our tier one uh, um, NEPA process that selected this quarter as the preferred route for connecting our states. In 2017, many years later, we finished the tier two FEIS and ROD, which cleared from an EPRS perspective the entire 162 miles between Raleigh and Richmond. In 2020, we won a $60 million, we won a uh, $47.5 million grant for a $60 million program to purchase the corridor in North Carolina from CSX, a, a process of which we're almost, almost complete with now. And that brings us to today, winning the largest grant in the fiscal year 21 Chrissy, FRA Chrissy program to enable opportunities for everybody in this crowd to, have, to see the beginning of this, this project and, the, um, and lay out the, the schedule to actually complete it. Mike mentioned that uh, Virginia has uh, been in the business of acquiring corridors and, and, and completing that. They've actually completed their acquisition of the, of the S-Line corridor uh, from, a, um, from northern North Carolina, Ridgeway, all the way up into um, Petersburg and, and points north from there. As I mentioned, we are nearly complete with that. This is a significant development because it means that for, for really, um, in a most unique way, we have a publicly owned rail corridor that allows us significant ability to use this corridor for um, high technology, high performance, and, uh, and, and uses that the uh, public entities have control over versus just a lease or a, uh, a track access on, on as we typically have on corridors. We've already begun the photogrammetry necessary. We've already begun the, uh, the aerial photography necessary um, with, with ground control. So we're, getting, we're ready to begin the survey on the project. We have the service development underway, an activity that we're working with Virginia Amtrak and the FRA on. We have broad community support. In North Carolina, we've been working with every community along the route between all the way even south of Raleigh to all the way down, down to Sanford and up to, up to Norlina north of Henderson. There's 162 miles of railroad design in this program and 82 miles of roadway design. It is a significant effort. And we're not stopping here. <coughs> Later in this presentation, you'll hear about our next steps, and that is to pursue grants that will come available this fall, maybe even this month, to continue to advance the, uh, the program going forward. I get real excited about this project because um, it is not your, uh, it's not your grandfather's railroad. It is not, it is not his Oldsmobile. We're talking about building something that really is the most technologically advanced uh, railroad in the Southeast uh, as we develop it. 110 mile per hour passenger railroad, uh, which you have to go all the way down to Florida, which hasn't quite developed their system yet uh, to get to that level of speeds. 91 new grade separations are, are being investigated as part of this program. A concrete tie railroad. We're, no longer, we're not looking at just wood tie um, uh, sleepers, as the British call them. We're looking at basically creating a very robust track structure. High speed switches. Um, high level platforms at stations so that there could be level boarding. Uh, freight bypass tracks were necessary so to enable freight to thrive at the same time as we grow passenger rail service. Uh, the most advanced uh, positive train control, uh, which is the automatic stop and uh, automa automated uh, train <coughs> operation system, and then advanced signal systems. This is just a quick image. This is only about two miles from here in Wake Forest, but this kind of goes to the place of the same idea. We're taking a railroad that was built uh, somewhere between 1834 and 1900, and we're turning it into the quarter of the future. That means it's going to be a lot straighter, a lot faster and a lot fewer and 
a lot fewer if no grade crossings. Uh, this is actually the Rogers Road grade separation area uh, through Wake Forest, and it shows you basically how we're looking at, you know, turning something that's basically a 50, 50 mile an hour design speed into something that, that can be 90 to 110 miles an hour. We are, uh, we, our integrated mobility division uh, led by Ryan Brumfield, and I believe he's somewhere in this audience. Um, um, okay, he is not today with us, but uh, he is, um, his group has been leading an effort uh, to work with the communities uh, all up and down the line to, to get them prepared for this opportunity of the S line by uh, identifying uh, mobility hub locations where their different transit and on-demand services can connect with the rail network. It's created a lot of excitement in the communities, the possibilities of a connect, connected network to help their, these uh, a, a burgeoning and, and developing downtowns uh, develop in a way that allows them to have exciting amenities and walkable communities. Um, it's a quarter-wide conversation. We're looking at funding and financing and transit operations that would be interconnected. Uh, looking at the land use plans and zonings for these communities, the regulatory policies, and the infrastructure investments necessary to pull it off. Lots of partners. Um, Mayor Jones explained, you know, that this project is exciting for her town. And uh, again, indeed, Wake Forest has been a huge advocate for what we're trying to do here and in, in creating this uh, significant new transportation mode and network. But lots of other partners all are, all are involved with the process as well, all the way from Sanford, as I mentioned, through Apex, Cary, Raleigh, um, Wake Forest, Franklinton, Youngsville, Henderson, Norlina, all those communities are engaged. We uh, recently, and we actually had last week, announced uh, that uh, as kind of a follow-on to this TODU effort, several of these communities are now taking on under the um, through a awarded raise grant, their FY22 raise grant, they're embarking on the next steps for mobility hubs. And uh, so seven different locations, uh, four of which will have, uh, a, a, will actually complete the NEPA uh, elements of their, of their station locations under this, under this, um, under this activity. So, just, this is just a brief slide to kind of show you uh, what uh, makes up this PE grant, you know, the core of what we're talking about today. Uh, the Raleigh to Richmond um, Chrissy 21 Preliminary Engineering. It's $57.9 million in federal funds that were awarded, in addition to $37.9 million in non-federal match. And that non-federal match included contributions from NCDOT through our STIP, from, from the VPRA through their budget, and Amtrak through their budget as well. Um, we actually have one construction component in this program, and that is the, that is the uh, Rogers Road grade separation just down the street from here. Uh, and the rest, 71.4 million, represents the, the entirety of the survey and preliminary engineering effort. And with that, we have a break. Um, and uh, so 15 minutes, and I don't know if I have any other instructions but this, but 15 minutes to kind of uh, take the information you've learned so far, mingle with some of the uh, folks that are here. Uh, we really do want folks to connect on this project. Uh, we want to see uh, uh, firms talk with firms, firms talk with our staff, um, engage with our small professional services firms that are here as well, and uh, have a conversation. And we'll be back in 15 minutes. Thank you.
because when they all put their other things together, Okay, sorry I had to get through a little technical difficulty. Um, again, thank you all for being here. It sounded like there were a lot of good conversations uh, at the break. Really appreciate everybody's um, opportunity here to communicate and collaborate and do all those things. We're getting ready to go into a series of slides on the design approach of the program. So, so get a little more into uh, the weeds and how we're going to, uh, some, some initial conversations on procurement and, um, and how we're going to kind of del uh, deliver this phase of the project. Um, I will say this, you know, obviously uh, we won the grant, I think, uh, two months ago, and, um, you know, we're, we're in the process of developing the full scope of, of uh, everything that goes into full delivery. So we, we are providing you the most recent and the most up-to-date information today. There may be some slight things to change here and there after today, but this is the most recent or most updated information we can provide. Uh, we're going to lead off with a NEPA update from Ron Lucas. Uh, Ron leads the Rail Division's planning and, and development branch um, and has a, a great background uh, both with FHWA and NCDOT and has been with our division now coming up on four years and uh, is an excellent, excellent guy and a smart guy. So thank you, Ron. Thank you, Jason, for that introduction. Oh, wow. It's great to be here today. I, I'm just so honored to see so many people I've worked with in the past. I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to share with you for just a few minutes. I only have two slides, so I'm not going to be long. Um, as far as our uh, NEPA approach, and I hope I can go ahead and advance the slides. Okay, all right. Well, uh, first thing I would say is that uh, NEPA, NEPA's already been completed for the Aslan Corridor. Um, we had a, um, we had a um, final EIS approved in September 2015. We had a record of decision approved in 2017, March of 2017. Um, the links to those documents are on your screen there uh, on the Connect site. Uh, being that this is a federal discretionary grant, uh, you know, there is a, a level of NEPA compliance that is required. Uh, for this effort here, we're going to go with two phases. Uh, the first phase will be an environmental screening. And basically that environmental screening will be a review of the conditions from the 2015 FEIS. Basically that's just taking a snapshot, taking a snapshot of what is out there now as far as the human and natural environment and comparing it to what was uh, out there in 2015 when we did the FEIS. Um, the goal of this environmental screening is actually more to inform the 30% design effort, um, identifying constraints, of identifying areas to avoid or minimize impacts to. Uh, we anticipate that the procurement will be through the current uh, rail project delivery uh, limited service contract or on call. Uh, and we do anticipate five contracts to cover the 162 mile corridor from Raleigh to Richmond. We do anticipate that procurement or this effort will start in the fall of 2022. And again, since reevaluations will be required. Um, being that the record of decision is more than five years old, um, we, we are required to do the <clears throat> reevaluations. But right now, the number of contracts are to be determined. We're going to let the uh, outcomes from the screening effort, and um, we're going to let the 30% design 
uh, progress kind of dictate how many contracts and, uh, and the scope of those reevaluations in coordination with FRA. Uh, we do anticipate that procurement being through RFP and being that, that um, this um, effort is more um, a, a result of some of the efforts up front, the procurement date is to be determined as we progress through the design and screening effort and the duration of uh, that effort should be between 18 and 24 months. And that's my two slides for you today. And that's it. <laughs> I said I was gonna be less than three minutes, I hope I was. But without further ado, we got Troy Creasy, Manager of Design and Construction. Uh, thank you, Ron. Um, just want to say I'm uh, very excited to be here today. I uh, see so many familiar faces and new faces. Uh, very excited with the turnout. So many people have contacted me over the last six months about this project, and my answer has been to show up in Wake Forest today and to hear about it at this industry day. Um, I got a lot of content to get through today. Um, I have I'm going to talk about surveying, um, rail design, and highway design. So. Um, just as a reminder, save your questions for the Q&A later, and um, hope this is very beneficial for you all. Okay, uh, starting off with uh, survey. Um, Rail Division has been working with NCDOT's photogrammetry and locations and surveys units to fine-tune the survey and mapping requests and limits. To date, we have set the survey control for the corridor using two LNS on-call firms, JMT and Dewberry, and have flown the corridor to obtain the aerial imagery. Primary control pairs have been established in each county for localization purposes. Current work in the area includes photogrammetry, uh, unit contracting with four of their LSC firms to produce the county mapping products. Uh, this work is anticipated to be completed this fall with the mapping files then provided to the locations and surveys unit for their field survey work. Locations and surveys is in the process of scoping and contracting with four of their on-call firms to begin setting secondary control points for the field survey work, uh, which will then be supplemented with additional contracts to complete all of the field work. The current thinking is that we, could, we would have two production survey firms per county to try to share the workload and expedite delivery of the survey files needed to progress the 30% design work. We are only requesting a scope of, surveys, um, scope of survey services needed to deliver the 30% design deliverables. SUE, level B and C, and the property ties will generally wait until after the initial final survey files have been delivered. This will allow our design production firms to get started on the design work and, pro and this provides some budget flexibility if we need to postpone some survey activities until later funding phases. We have not yet confirmed scheduled delivery dates, but the initial discussions right now um, have uh, survey products uh, being um, completed towards uh, the end of next year, fall of 2023. NCDOT and BPRA are in active discussions on the best way to obtain survey data in Virginia and will likely enlist the help of VDOT to procure that information. Assuming that's the case, procurement of mapping and surveying firms in Virginia would be guided by VDOT's contracting methods, but we would anticipate the survey delivery schedule to line up with North Carolina's so that we can maintain design momentum. All right, things that we are working on currently include the development of program design criteria, which will allow, uh, which will be followed with a basis of design concept. Uh, this exercise is taking the various design standards from CSX, Amtrak, FRA, AREMA, NCDOT, and VPRA, and distilling them into a program rail design criteria for concurrence by the project stakeholders. This includes things such as design speed, curve geometry, turnout sizes, tie selection, typical sections, drainage criteria, super elevation, structural design requirements. We're creating a matrix uh, document noting the various stakeholder criteria 
and will then distill a list of program criteria for an agreement uh, prior to initiating the 30% design work. We're also updating the FEIS alignment with standard project stationing and slight design changes to meet Amtrak Spec 63 standards. Additionally, there are several locations throughout the corridor where the steady changes is warranted due to design and operating speed considerations, as well as construction and development that's con uh, occurred over the last five to seven years, uh, which everyone in this crowd is familiar with the rapid growth in the Raleigh um, metropolitan area where there are a lot of things that exist today that didn't exist five to seven years ago. We're also looking at station areas and how to inc incorporate freight bypass tracks or dedicated station tracks, whichever st situation is more appropriate at a given location. We are investigating locations for incremental, incremental endpoints with concepts for layover tracks and maintenance away tracks to help facilitate future maintenance of the Raleigh to Richmond Railroad Corridor. Finally, we are drafting interlocking schematics and construction phasing schematics, which, uh, which are Amtrak deliverable requirements during this design phase. One of the more critical items we'll be undertaking during the 15% design phase is an update to project cost estimates. I think we're all aware of the renewed interest in project cost and understanding the cost of delivery of the right of way and construction phases of the project is crucial to the pursuit of additional grant funding opportunities, which we'll talk, uh, talk about more later. Um, moving on to the next slide here. All of the preliminary work under the 15% design phase is being performed by consulting firms under our existing rail program delivery LSA and will be, be passed off onto one or two rail <coughs> oversight firms selected to continue the technical delivery uh, into and beyond the 30% design phase, which we'll talk about later in greater detail. So what happens next? NCDOT and VPRA are currently working to identify one or two PEFs to serve as the rail oversight design managers for the development of the 30% design work. The current vision is that NCDOT will contract two different tasks under our rail program delivery LSC to support the states with one task responsible for the oversight of the North Carolina rail design segments and the Virginia rail design segments. These two tasks could be the same firm or they could be two different firms. We anticipate identifying this consultant resource later this summer or early this fall and we'll work to get them on board by the end of the year. Primary tasks assigned to these oversight firms include the control of program design criteria, review of all plans and submittals for their assigned segments, ownership of the alignment equities, application of program typical sections and design details, and review of and ownership of state level project estimates. These oversight roles would also serve to coordinate project design work with external stakeholders, generally the FRA, Amtrak, and CSX as a single point of contact. The oversight firms will report to state level rail engineering manager and would be expected to submit um, uh, expected to support subsequent design phases, assuming the work remains satisfactory. I should note that teams are assigned this task, teams that are assigned this task are expected to be multidisciplinary and will be able to review all technical discipline work. Later this, uh, later this fall into early winter, we will start drafting the design production RFP documents for delivery of the design production work. We have segmented the rail project into a minimum of 10 design contract phases, each with multiple, likely somewhere between two and four, civil construction contracts under them. The design segments range in length from 10 to 20 miles, um, with four segments in North Carolina and six segments in Virginia. Our intent is to procure the 10 design contracts as a part of two RFPs, one for the North Carolina projects, and one for the Virginia projects. So again, one RFP, four firms selected in North Carolina, six in Virginia. This process will occur in the first half of 2023 so that we have RFPs advertised, firms selected, scoped, and NTP issued just ahead of delivery of the final survey deliverables. We would expect each of the design contracts to be pursued by full service teams, firms capable of delivering final construction plans so inclusive of track design, structures, hydraulics, 
geotechnical, erosion control, etc. This will allow us to structure the contracts in order to grant us flexibility of continuing the same firm into final design. Great Kill uh, will elaborate on that more in the presentation. Each of the design deliverables will report to a NCDOT rail design project manager and will be expected to work closely with the oversight firms that we select. A note about the 30% design, design deliverables and what they look like. We're currently reviewing two uh, guidance documents to help guide the work associated with this task that many in this room are familiar with. Please reach out to me if you need either of these guidance documents, but they will serve as inspiration for the design delivery RFPs. The first guidance document is the Amtrak Spec 63, specifically Section 11, Engineering Documents. With Amtrak both as a project funding partner, as well as a future development partner, we will adhere to ex expectations set out in this section for the content of the design plans. This will be further clarified within our program design criteria. There's a handy table within section 11.1.2 if folks want to study further. And again, um, come see me after the presentation for more information on that. The second guidance document is NCDOT's project delivery network, task 2RD1, uh, which is the uh, complete the design recommendation plan set. This guidance document helps us interface with other units within the department in a structured way and generally scopes the plan deliverables we are expecting to provide to meet this grant funding. As most of you know, the department is moving fully towards completing design work using Bentley's OpenX platform with projects going forward. It is our expectation that projects designed within North Carolina will comply with this and will utilize Open Roads Designer, Open Rail Designer, if you can make a case for it, open bridge, and any other OpenX products necessary. We, we are aware that there may be some growing pains, but we anticipate that the production firms will have the expertise in place to deliver the design work required in the required format, and we'll expect oversight firms that we select to assist across design segments. We will work with our Virginia partners to determine which design software will be required for the Virginia se segments. It may be OpenX, it may be Geopack. And we will identify within the RFP for those design segments. The design production tasks are expected to really start ramping up towards the end of next year and are expected to continue for 12 to 18 months, depending on the segment with a grant application goal of having the 30% design deliverables completed by May of 2025. Naturally, and uh, naturally, delivery and completion of the design segments will be dependent on the complexity of the segment. And we expect staggering completion to help utilize our review resources. But the overall goal is completion by late spring of 2025. That generally covers the rail design contracts the department expects to need as a part of project delivery. But a couple others should be noted. As a major stakeholder in the project, CSX will likely task one to two GEC firms to complete plan review tasks on their behalf. We have started initial conversations with CSX about sourcing this work and will continue to coordinate with them during the early design phase. Of course, with Amtrak having a sizable funding stake in this project and potential future obligations, we expect them to source a GC firm for plan review for work as well. Additionally, Amtrak and CSX may be called on to source the signal design contracts, though that's not a detail that has been finalized at this time. There are parts of the project where both Amtrak and CSX would likely be owners of that design work. A note about, and uh, just to finish up with this portion, a note about conflicts of interest. Uh, this is an area we have identified as something to proactively address and be transparent about with our industry partners. It should go without saying that if a firm is selected with an oversight role, they would be conflicted from doing design production within the segments covered by that oversight. But there may be some instances where firms have specific questions about potential conflict of roles. 
I suggest, if you have some questions, to please submit those to us in writing so we can investigate and clarify for the sake of the program. We will be working on a conflict of interest matrix to assist us in identifying areas of concern and addressing things on the front end. One of the biggest questions, anticipated production schedule. So you'll see here, um, and this is all tentative for the purposes of this uh, industry day here, by the way, but it is a good guide right now in terms of where we're currently at. Um, so you'll notice uh, environmental screening, Ron's portion here, uh, wrapping up um, in quarter two, 2023, um, survey, um, design products, wrapping up, uh, end of 2023 into the first quarter of 2024. Uh, rail design, uh, largely matching with roadway design, um, likely uh, beginning towards the end of quarter two, 2023, um, as those survey products become available, and likely finishing up uh, quarter two of 2025. Um, obviously, within all that, there will be NEPA reevaluation um, as necessary. Okay, so a lot of people might not know this in the room. Uh, there are R2R projects currently set to go to construction. Uh, we have four great separations in Wake County um, that are a part of the delivery of this S-Line project, uh, which great separates some of the uh, busier crossings here in the city of Raleigh and Wake County, uh, provide um, added safety and reliability and allow us to uh, increase speeds in the future. Um, the project closest to where we're standing right now, Rogers Road, uh, set to let uh, next October. Also, uh, Durant Road, further down uh, in the Raleigh, um, set to let in July 2023. Uh, Millbrook, um, July 2025, and um, New Hope in uh, July 2023. Again, those, those projects, uh, the, the design is complete, and um, are, are, are aligned with the delivery of this project. <coughs> All right, uh, with that, I'm going to uh, introduce Greg Kill, uh, Rail Division Manager of Contracts. Thank you. to the mic. Is that better? There we go. All right. Well, I'm very excited. Um, we, we had a number of uh, LSCs that we advertised in the past year, and, um, and we always hate telling firms that weren't selected. Well, I'm sorry about that, but did you see how many RFPs are coming up? Uh, so a lot of opportunities. Uh, hopefully some of the firms that may have not have been selected for uh, LSCs will be, have a chance at these RFPs. So I'm very excited about that. Um, okay, so the anticipated methods of procurement uh, for survey in North Carolina uh, will be using existing uh, NCDOT location and surveys, uh, LSC, and, uh, and in Virginia, uh, that'll be a VDOT uh, procured. For the design work uh, in North Carolina and Virginia, all tasks, oh, can you go back to the, the previous slide? Did I hit that? Okay. Yeah, back to the, the green square. Um, so for North Carolina and Virginia, all tasks uh, for current grants are anticipated to be procured uh, through North Carolina Department of Transportation. And then right-of-way acquisition and construction is still to be determined. Okay. Okay, so for doing engineering in North Carolina and Virginia, um, responsible engineer and firm, um, <coughs> let me get my nose closer, must be uh, properly licensed and registered in North Carolina, and then that would also go for Virginia as well. And these are the nuts and bolts here. So for doing business with NCDOT, uh, private consulting firms must be pre-qualified uh, with NCDOT. And these pre-quals uh, are discipline specific. You can't just get a general pre-qualification. As many of you know, you have to uh, get pre-qualified in hydraulics or rail codes or roadway design, what have you. Uh, some of these disciplines require a North Carolina uh, PE license. Um, 
and, and uh, that also requires firms to be registered um, at NC Bells, and I, I believe the name on the website is something else now, but if you Google uh, NC Bells, uh, you'll be able to get to that website. Um, the uh, application is required, um, as, as far as pre-quals, the application is required by the, uh, the deadline of the, R, of the RFP, although you don't have to be approved yet, you need to be in the pipeline. The qualifications are good for three years, uh, but do require an annual renewal. And this guidance applies to work performed in North Carolina, uh, guidance for work performed in Virginia, still to be determined. Sorry about that. And primarily wanted to show this slide. Uh, I think Tanya Smith will discuss this further. Uh, but wanted to at least make you realize that there is a certification for small businesses uh, and we do encourage, uh, if, if you're a small professional services firm, uh, please seek after the certification. Uh, I believe this is the, the website here that you can go to, um, but we, we really would love to, for you to uh, get the certification. We've got a number of firms already working for rail um, that could apply for this. and. Uh, and maybe due to manpower they just don't have the time uh, or can't get to that. But we encourage you uh, to please seek out that certification. Uh, we also, in talking with our larger firms, uh, we encourage them to, to team up uh, with SPSF firms. Uh, and in our uh, advertisements, uh, there's, um, we really encourage there the, the involvement of the SPSF firms. Uh, in fact, I, I think we, um, we advise that we give a little bit more consideration to firms that are heavy. Uh, with SPSF. So as you're teaming together and putting together uh, turnkey services, uh, please include uh, or consider these SPSF firms. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so there is a, will obviously be a construction component later on and just want to make people aware that there's also pre-qualification required for that. And um, especially if you're bidding on contracts, uh, in this case, uh, you must be uh, pre-qualified and approved before you can place the bid. With consulting, it can be in the pipeline, but for the actual construction work, you have to be approved uh, prior to the bid. And this is here primarily to show the link uh, for pre-qualification for consultants. And the, this is the consultant advertisement, so there's a link at the top for that. Um, and also wanted to point out here that as you're going through these, this includes everything at, at NCDOT. This is not just rail, this is highway, ferry, aviation, everything. Um, and you'll see on the, on the red over here, uh, these are hyperlinks, so you can click on that and it'll take you to the actual advertisement. You'll also notice that there's an advertisement date there, it tells you when it was posted, and then there's a deadline. And that's a hard deadline. If you're at 12.01 p.m., you're too late. Uh, so I encourage you that as you're, as you're pursuing these advertisements, if you see yourself having a hard time getting it submitted, please contact the Professional Services Management Unit before, way before noon, because there, there may be um, some grace there. Mr. Streep, I hope I'm not over speaking here. Um, <laughs> but if you call them at 12.01, you're too late. Uh, to that, that is a hard deadline. And with that, um, I give it over to Tanya Smith. Thank you. I am not that tall, so let me lower this to a more appropriate height for me. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Tanya Smith and I serve as the director for the Office of Civil Rights at the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Now that just a little bit more, okay. So I am so excited to be here today to discuss the Raleigh to Richmond uh, S-Line project or R2R as it is called. It is such an important initiative, not only for commuters, but for residents along the way. Our office is involved to ensure that small and minority-owned businesses are at the table to take advantage 
of the opportunities that will be available at this high speed rail becomes reality. Julie White is also to be commended for collaborating with our office and the planning of this project for the last couple of years and for her commitment to elevating inclusiveness and innovation. Working so closely with all modes of transportation, not just the division of highways, um, is a new and exciting initiative for our office to be at the table on all the multimodal projects. We are committed to working with all of our stakeholders to improve mobility opportunities for the state, including underserved communities. I have communicated with my counterpart in Virginia, uh, Ms. Sandra Norman at the Virginia Department of Transportation, and we will be working together to ensure opportunities are known and to identify and mitigate barriers that may be prohibiting small and minority owned businesses from participating in this economic boost. Not only will there be years of work designing, permitting, and construction on the rail, but also plan or upgrades to existing rail stations in Raleigh, Cary, and Durham. There will be a new rail station uh, in Hillsboro that will serve Chapel Hill, Carboro, and area transit services. New stations have been proposed on the R2R line from Raleigh to Wake Forest and counties to the Northeast. I have a PowerPoint to go over what our office offers for small minority owned businesses and how we execute our mission. And before I go into the PowerPoint, I wanna take a moment to also mention that we have quite a bit of small professional services firms in the room today, as well as key NCDOT leadership. Small professional service firms, if you are in the room, please take this opportunity to match make with other services, other firms that can really help you get engaged in all of these opportunities. Um, so I'll go over our certification on the job and business opportunity and workforce development program. Uh, and I can actually see it here, right? Okay. So our DBE certification is a disadvantaged business enterprise, and that's primarily for federal projects. We also have the minority women business enterprise certification, and that's for state projects. We also have our small business enterprise program. Uh, that's for maintenance projects uh, below $1 million. That's a threshold that was increased from the General Assembly about a year ago. We also have our small professional service firms program. Um, that's our consultant architectural engineering GIS program. And as of recently, the SBSF program has been codified into law, which means that it's been made permanent in state law. Uh, as well as we now have the ability to do DBE goal setting on our professional services contract. So more to come with that. That's been some new legislation in the past month or so. We also have our historically underutilized businesses, which is state projects um, administered through the NC Department of Transportation. Uh, we also have the SBE hub program that's now online through the Department of, of Administration as well. What are the objectives of the DBE program? I'm, I'm asked this a lot. It's to ensure non-discrimination in transportation contracting. For example, highway, transit, aviation. It's to create a level playing field where DBEs can compete fairly for DOT-assisted contracts. To ensure only firms that fully meet eligibility standards are permitted to participate as DBEs. Uh, to assist in development of firms to compete successfully in the marketplace outside the DBE program. Certification is a tool to help the business grow. So what's the basic eligibility criteria? Well, you must be socially disadvantaged. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, you must be a member of certain census-designated uh, groups, African-American, Hispanic-American, Native American, Asian Pacific, 
subcontinent Asian American or women owned. You must also be economically disadvantaged with a personal net worth below $1.32 million. Also, small business size limits. So your gross receipts must be below $28.48 million. And then the AC is an airport concession DBE program, and that's below $56.42 million. Um, you must be in full, uh, at least majority ownership of the business, at least 51% owned by the disadvantaged member. And control, we, we get this question a lot, you must control the business, um, the management, the policy, and the operations. The certification process is multi-step. Step one, the packet is reviewed for completeness. It takes about 30 days. Um, if complete, a certification officer reviews your information. Then a virtual site visit is conducted at the primary place of business. Um, step four, after the site visit and through review of the information, a certification decision is issued. Um, and you're notified of that determination. We're looking at about 90 days or so. Uh, step five, if certified, the firm information is entered online um, in our DBE directory, which is a great tool for marketing for firms. Many entities use our directory of firms to see what firms are available to do work. If denied certification, the firm has the right to appeal the decision directly to USDOT. Note that in North Carolina, we are what they call the UCP, the Unified Certification Provider, and they, we have 90 days to render an eligibility decision after receiving a complete application. So we certify here at North Carolina DOT for all the local municipalities, for all the transit agencies in the state. Next slide. We are online, we're not just paper anymore. So we have an online certification portal we have begun accepting certification applications and renewals for our certifica certification programs online. Um, and you would just go to our Connect site and we can walk you through the portals. But we have a DBE application, the small business application, and the small professional service application. And I'm hearing there's a lot of professional service firms who's eligible for the small business designation. Please, please, I encourage you, it's not a robust process to become SBSF certified. And the rail division really, it helps them to really show that they're working with small businesses, which is our goal for inclusiveness. So please, we can help you walk through the process. It is not cumbersome. And this is really to improve the efficiency in our certification and renewal process. There is a dec decrease in processing time by using the online portal. Next slide. Benefits of being DBE certified is free marketing in our directory of firms, our business opportunity workforce development DBE uh, program has supportive services, contract protection, and we have hub reciprocity. And I'm going to add that our SBE program, SBSF program, is now been funded by our secretary of NCDOT, uh, Secretary Eric Boyette. So we do have supportive services dollars for our small business program. Next slide. Um, our small business enterprise facts. Um, it's an NCDOT program. It's not federally mandated. It's something that the state has um, put together to make sure that we're really being robust and have a, a full spectrum approach on our small business community. It's a purchase order program for projects below one million. And again, that threshold has been um, increased in the past year or so. Projects will be advertised as SBE set-asides and only those firms can respond. So you're competing against other small businesses. There's no pre-qualification required. It is a race and gender neutral program. There's no goals on this program. Um, general contracting license and bonding may be waived. Next slide. The types of SBE projects are grubbing, uh, clearing and grading, hauling stone, other materials, erosion control, which we saw a lot of in the previous slide from the rail division, uh, landscaping, paint striping, drainage, signal insulation, fencing guardrail, um, you name it. There's a lot of SBE type projects and 
um, what's advertised as an SBE project is really determined internally, so there's opportunities for us to enhance those types of contracts. The Small Professional Services Firm Program was developed to provide consultants opportunities for firms that meet the eligibility criteria. So consultants were not originally written into the SBE program, so there's a separate program for the SBSF. And those firms like the SBEs will compete uh, comparably positioned uh, with other firms in the industry. It's a race and gender neutral program. Um, you also must meet the SBA size standards that have been outlined. Uh, recent legislation allows for restricting contracts to SPSF only. Next slide. And there's a lot of words on one slide. I'm so sorry. I can see it better on my laptop. But um, our balanced supportive services, we just have so much to say, it's hard to not you know, put it all on a slide deck. We offer a newly certified firm orientation designed to introduce DBEs to uh, North Carolina DOT's processes, our websites, uh, information to develop a game plan for success. Uh, we partner with NC State, uh, we call it ITRI, the Institute for Transportation Research and Education for classes. DBEs do not pay to participate. Um, if they come to us, we'll help them find a slot in these classes. Um, the North Carolina uh, State University Construction Management Diploma, DBEs may be reimbursed if you choose to attend. We also have a mentor protege program and a burgeoning new incubator program for firms to help them along the way to create and improve the skills of, of our firms. Um, we also have our business development program to provide DBEs with general and one-on-one uh, firm-specific training. We have a new series that we call Getting to the Yes. It's a training program and it's an ongoing series centered on understanding and winning contract, contracts with NCDOT. And so that's been going on for the past year and it's been very successful. We really do case management and help firms walk through the processes. We're also hosting a new, numerous educational webinars. We've had several on um, IIJA and um, different legislation and funding because we understand the challenges of our small businesses do not always have access to this critical information to compete and become successful. So we're really engaging with our stakeholders to bring awareness to the firms. We're also having outreaches centered around large projects. For instance, the I-26 connector project, Toyota battery plan, I-95, et cetera, and now the, the S-Line project. We're really building our momentum around project-specific events and opportunities to make sure that the project is successful and the community and the firms get to participate. We're also offering one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, so please reach out if your firm needs any type of help. There's a large array of services we can provide. Next slide. Our on-the-job training program is an in-house training program that we have to center around construction trades. Um, and so as we go on with the projects with the Estland Corridor, you get into the construction phase, there may be opportunities for that program. And I won't go through all the details, but next slide. Our on-the-job training program, trainees enrolled in program by participating contractors it's an apprenticeship-like model with a variety of trade classifications. And it's a contractor by contract based work assignments. Um, trainees can access tra advanced training opportunities and specialty disciplines, CDL, heavy equipment operation. And we currently have 250 on-the-job trainees enrolled statewide. I will say an enhancement to our on-the-job training programs, we will offer training for the um, electric vehicle and deployment strategy. So that will have quite a bit of different work codes and training opportunities available. So please stay tuned. Next slide. Um, our Highway Construction Trades Academies are located in priority project areas, uh, currently hosted by community-based organization. Um, there will be several upcoming that will might entail working with community colleges um, and maybe even a faith-based organization or two. We have four active, Rocky Mount, Charlotte, Fayetteville, Winston-Salem, future sites on the horizon, 
it's usually a two to six week program um, and we have a number of curriculum safety you name it well we can add curriculum down the line so we will be developing this out more next slide our outreach and workforce development our agency is really really big on outreach and particular workforce development to help the industry with the labor that you need to really be successful um, and to make sure businesses are getting opportunities our on-the-job training program collaborates with the following partners, primes, DBEs, CAGC, highways, private training providers, community-based nonprofits, community colleges, and C-Works. Next slide. We have our team listed here. Um, and I'll also say in the room today, because we want to help facilitate conversation, I will ask for my team to stand up. Um, Lisa Wilson is our BOWD manager. Um, she's there, her office provides all these great resources and um, support that you need. We also have in the back, um, Mr. Benny Sloan, who's our certification manager. He's an engineer, he can talk your talk, he can really help you to facilitate. Um, we also have our HBCU intern, Ms. Debbie Walker. She's in the back to help you. She's in the pink. And we also have Athena Stanfield, um, our diversity communications specialist. She's really been helping us to get the word out. And do we have any more comms? I thought I saw Lauren before. There you go, in the back. Um, the communications team has really been helping us get the word out about these projects. They're producing flyers. They're posting them in your local papers. We're doing direct mailers. We're doing social media sites. And so please stay connected to our NCDOT page and our social media sites because these opportunities that you're hearing today are, are going to be posted not just on our Connect site, but we're doing outreaches and posting that on our social sites. Lauren, did I get it right? Am I missing anything? Okay, Athena? Okay, all right, thank you. Well, that's all that I have, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Tanya. The, this program, as, as Tanya um, spoke about, and is really what we're trying to do with DOT leading in, is um, creating opportunities where, you know, we, um, through this program, it's a tremendous opportunity unto itself, and we want to make sure that there's opportunities for the widest uh, possible uh, group of professionals to participate. So we're glad to, glad to have be working with OCR and DOT and the um, organization in uh, Virginia as well that oversees uh, their OCR as well. So um, great partnership there as well. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about you know this is this is just the beginning. We've been over some um, exciting. Uh, information uh, if you're an engineer and you really like to nerd out on you know the details of you know how uh, uh, what is being developed and how we're doing it um, that's super exciting for me but we're but uh, we're not stopping uh, just at the PE effort uh, the uh, 71.4 million that's on that will be on the street for this program uh, or, or opportunity for this program is just really the beginning that's 30 percent engineering but um, as my team knows, I like to build stuff. Um, really like to build stuff. Don't like to just plan things. And I know most consultants don't like just to plan things. They like to see their, their work actually get uh, constructed. Um, you know, we've, at our division, we've had uh, a lot of success with building things. We've won a lot of grants, and we've actually been able to see those, those projects successfully implemented, both passenger freight and safety projects. Um, one of the best examples of that is the Piedmont Improvement Program, one of the few programs that was delivered on time and within, and within budget uh, within the FRA's program, which is a great track record for us to lean on as we endeavor on this program. So the good thing right now is uh, rail, um, inner city rail specifically, has got more funding available for it through federal programs than in the history really, of uh, publicly funded passenger rail in our country. Um, with the passage of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, 
we're seeing levels of funding on an annual basis uh, in the multiple billions. And that is a very different picture than what we have seen uh, in, in historically. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing right now is strategizing around these opportunities. Um, between our organization and Virginia's organization, we have some of the best projects, really, I think, nationally that can compete for this level of funding. So we watch the US DOT and uh, specifically my organization, the FRA's programs very, very closely. And uh, we've been monitoring, uh, and I'm sure that you all have been monitoring it too, there are, are notices of funding opportunity that have been rolling out uh, this year under the, the previous programs, but the FY22 money uh, for the various <coughs> programs from USDOT and, um, and FRA are, have significant sums of money in them. So um, there already is a couple of opportunities on the street. There's a great crossing elimination program that uh, communities across our state are already uh, looking at as an opportunity, including those on the S line. Um, but this month, and probably in the next, maybe even tomorrow, maybe next week, there's going to be an announcement for the uh, Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvement Program, FRA's CRISI program. And uh, that will put, uh, we think, about a $1.5 billion on the street. Um, and, we're, and we and uh, Virginia are both looking at that program very carefully and will be submitting opportunities there. Uh, additionally, the, feds, the federal state uh, partnership program, um, which used to be called the federal state partnership for state good pair, is now the federal state partnership for inner city passenger rail, and it is funded at significant levels. Um, that announcement we anticipate through a notice of funding opportunity, which is the beginning of the application period, um, in October of this year. Um, so. We anticipate that um, there are a number of different other opportunities are going to come forward, and, and we're going to be. And one of the things that we want to do is take advantage of these opportunities. Now, it's a strategic project. The NEPA completion of the project makes it unique nationally in its readiness for advancement into the next level of of, uh, of funding. So we showed you a schedule slide for sort of the current effort. Uh, in one of Troy's slides early in the presentation that covered the PE um, effort that, that uh, we're embarking now. But we have line of sight to additional funding that would be brought into the program so that this thing is not just a 30% PE effort, but it's a 65% plan effort. It's a 100% plan effort. It's a right-of-way acquisition effort. And it's a construction effort. So, um, this schedule shows uh, kind of what our vision is. I, I spoke in my, earlier in the presentation about the sort of the, there's a 2030 goal of us looking at an impl implementation of Raleigh to Petersburg. So that's represented here in the first few blocks of this of this slide, with construction to Petersburg, an aggressive goal to get there by 2030, with imp implementation of service in 2031. This is a very aggressive goal but I have a very aggressive boss who tells me to get things done very, very fast. Um, I also went through the insanity of the Piedmont Improvement Program, so maybe I am just insane. But um, this, this is an aggressive program that we'd like to see you know, push forward. Um, and then on the heels of that, we would be looking at building the, the, some other segments, the segment between Petersburg and Richmond that would close the network uh, in addition to Vir Virginia's work uh, to bring their effort down uh, to Main Street Station in Richmond for a connected service. So all that by 2040 with high frequency um, passenger rail service using modern trains at high frequency um, as the outcome. So this is just a graphic showing uh, kind of what I just mentioned. Uh, we've got, we're looking at the quarter as a whole. Um, we're, we're, we're talking with USDOT, we're talking with FRA about what is the best way to implement this program um, given that it is, it's a sizable program, um, but it can be, but there is a, a strategy of delivery that can actually create um, usable segments uh, as we, and, and build the thing out over that period of time I mentioned. Um, with the 
as I mentioned, right of way final design and construction, that's what, that's what our eye is to. We're, we're going to begin this process, but we're going to begin applying for those phases of the project, um, even this fall. And then we'll be developing a phase implementation plan. Um, it'll be necessary for us to uh, look at what the delivery packages uh, need, need to be as we move forward. It'll be an important component of what we discuss with uh, all of you who participate in this program um, through, through the contracts and also the industry at large, uh, the construction industry, the Carolinas AGC, uh, about how do, we deliver, how, how do we deliver this program in a way that we can, we can absorb this level of effort. So our next steps. We are working actively on a, on a memorandum of understanding with our partners uh, at, at uh, BPRA and Amtrak. And uh, we're preparing, as I mentioned, for the future grant applications that are really going to let this thing off the ground. Part of that is working with lots of partners on matching opportunities uh, because these programs at FRA are typically 80-20 with a 20% non-federal match. Um, in, in North Carolina, that match typically would come from the State Transportation Improvement Program. Um, and so we are looking at projects that um, can be used to leverage, leverage those opportunities. The three projects uh, in North Raleigh, uh, Durant, Millbrook, and New Hope are part of that strategy. But we need other projects as well, and we need to prioritize some projects that are within the STIP or maybe on the bubble of the STIP but maybe can be swapped in to consider how we, we can deliver this program and create the matching opportunities. We're working with other partners, um, uh, both on the Virginia side and North Carolina side, uh, and using other matching sources and funding that can support uh, this, this level of effort. We will continue our strong coordination with our partners at VPRA, uh, the communities, which we are regularly discussing, um, you know, the, the, the impact of this and the positive things that this project can do, and other stakeholders. Um, we're going to continue our conversation with you, the industry, uh, in how we deliver this program and, uh, and listen to your great thoughts. And uh, we'll ex again, expediting the program. This PE program is going to be huge. If there's a way to move it faster, let us know. They're going to have these contracts on the street, um, you know, and we're going to be looking for uh, y'all to develop teams that are smart about the work, provide opportunity, and uh, quickly get to the business of getting the work done. And uh, that really is, is the case both for this PE effort and also as we move into right-of-way and construction as well. And so with that, we come to the Q&A section. We have some rules, I think, or we have a microphone uh, that is here uh, that we can use, and I think we've got a, a uh... okay, great, we've got a couple microphones we'll put in the aisles. I'm going to ask, I think most of our team is collected at the front that will support me in this. I do not have answers to all your questions, I assure you, um, but I will try to find the folks uh, that, that do. Um, this time, we We'll open it up for Q&A. Oh my goodness, we already have a question in here from online. That's fantastic. Um, and this is going to be for you, Tanya. Uh, so you might want to come up here. Is SBE certification available for out-of-state businesses? SBE is an in-state certification. That was the easy answer. <laughs> she knew it and I didn't know, so it's great. Um, okay, at this point we'll just open it to anybody. Yes. That was a great presentation, Jason. Thank you. I'm Harit Badu with Gav Fleming, and uh, during this conversation, nothing has been mentioned about the trains or the electrification. Uh, is that even a consideration? Are you planning on running diesel, you know, power stores, and if you can elaborate on that, I would appreciate it. Okay, so you're talking about the type of uh, propulsion that yes. has the service. Well, um, th so I will say this, electrification of the line is not included in the FEI FEIS rod, so, that, so it is not considered to be an electrifi electrified corridor, at least not, not initially. So uh, traditional uh, propulsion sources are, are, are considered, being considered uh, diesel electric. 
I will say that Amtrak um, is, is part of their procurement of their train sets, which will be running over this corridor, is a dual mode electric and diesel um, type train. So the, the capability of the trains to actually uh, take advantage of that technology will be there. Uh, but, but a lot will happen in the next several years as we look at uh, other forms of uh, technology propulsion, including battery technology and, uh, and other, other forms. So. Yeah, that question is, uh, has there any been uh, talk about where the maintenance yards or anything like that along the alignment are being proposed or planned? Are you considered? Like, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that question. Sorry, uh, the maintenance yards and things of that nature along the corridor, uh, have they been thought about where the location for such maintenance facilities would exist? Excellent question. Uh, Short answer is yes, we are actually uh, really kind of separate from this program. We're doing developing some, uh, some considerations for maintenance yards. I mentioned in one of my slides that we have a major facility in Charlotte that we're in the process of developing. Uh, that will be an opportunity as well, um, you know, to, uh, as we develop that facility to handle the trains that will run over the entirety of the quarter, Charlotte, all the way up to the Northeast quarter. And I think, believe Virginia is looking at some, uh, some opportunities in their state as well. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Okay, I have a question from online. It says, uh, when will the uh, Raleigh to Richmond, or Richmond to Raleigh, whatever your preference is, uh, be shovel ready? Um, well, that is an excellent question. It's actually the question of the hour. And what I always respond to this question is it depends on the funding, but we're really good about getting funding. So I think really soon. Um, you know, the delivery methods, which will be a conversation that we go into, you know, following on from um, from this effort, uh, I think will determine how we actually progress. You know, progress in, into the the actual construction of the project. But um, this effort will lead, uh, hopefully, right into a right of way acquisition effort. And and right on the heels of right of way acquisition, we'd like to turn dirt. So I think my my schedule slide showed construction beginning as early as 2024, 2025, depending upon delivery method. Um, and depending upon availability of funding. I feel like John Carson. <laughs> <laughs> Is North Carolina prepared to fund the match for these projects? And has the money been approved for those projects? Um, I think that that, is, uh, that actually is, a, is an important question. Um, well, and I really, I really want to. I'm not going to speak for Virginia because I think they've they've got a, a funding strategy of their own uh, worked out um, through sources that they have. But for, as far as North Carolina is concerned, um, we are actively lining up the funding sources that would be the match. Um, right now, the STIP is the primary funding source, and so great separations that are funded in the STIP are one of the best places that we can use to leverage. Uh, additional scope to actually build these projects and so they're incredibly important to us uh, in addition to that we are looking to our partners in the communities um, as well as others to to see if they can bring additional resources but and, and in kind match like right-of-way is another another or, or additional property that could be available to the project is another opportunity to create in kind matches as for the federal opportunity so we're looking at all those things other questions we have a lot of time. Okay, the question was, how does Sanford, uh, which is outside of the Raleigh to Richmond uh, corridor, fit into the picture? Here's what I'll say. Um, the, the, the creation of this corridor connecting Raleigh to Richmond on a segment that really is the I mean, this, this project is the only way to get capacity to connect those two locations. Um, and so communities like Sanford will benefit because all of a sudden you've got a, a high capacity system that feeds uh, the network um, you know, th throughout this area. Uh, and, and, and both regionally and from an inner city standpoint. Um, we have been working with Sanford uh, closely uh, through our TOD efforts. Also been working with Amtrak, uh, you know, on on some interest they have there as well. So um, there's going to be opportunities, and not just in Sanford, but in every other community that would have uh, a developing or building a passenger rail service in the state, 
will need connection to this high capacity, high volume core to ensure you have a very well connected passenger rail system. So that's that's my general message, not just to Sanford, but into any community that's interested in what does this project do, you know, for them. Hey Jason, Roger Rochelle, Hardesty in Hanover. Uh, maybe Troy could step through the number of contracts again. If I understood correctly, 30% design on both the rail and right away, you've got maybe 10 RFPs and maybe 32 RFPs. I think I understood that for one would be one advertisement that would result in 10 contracts or is it 10 separate RFPs? And is do I have the correct understanding that DOT will be handling the procurement for design services regardless of geographic location? It's gonna be one RFP um, with, with 10 um, contracts coming out from that. Uh, four in North Carolina and six in Virginia um, all handled by MCDOT. Okay. And that's the rail side? The rail side, and, yes. And what about the roadway side? Uh, so roadway, um, there's actually, Jamal's not here right now. It's going to look similar, but they're going to be more, one RP with more contracts. Um, I don't know the exact number, but it's going to look very similar. Would you anticipate, or maybe you don't know yet, that those would be North Carolina procurements even if they're located in Virginia on the roadway side? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's an important um, point here. I think it was it was in a couple of the presentations, but um, the NCDOT and in our division are, is taking a lead on the whole effort um, with support from VPRA and our and our other partners. Um, but the procurement itself uh, is intended to be um, through, through the DOT, NCDOT process. All right, let's see. Ron, I'm gonna need you for this one. Do you anticipate public outreach during the NEPA reevaluation phase, and what will that look like? Okay, this is a very simple question, a very good question. The answer is yes. Um, we do anticipate uh, public uh, outreach. Um, and what would that look like? Um, a workshop, informal hearing. Um, we will um, kind of get through the, um, after the screen, of course, and development of the 30% uh, design, um, we will go ahead and, and, and take a look at how that approach will be, or when will that happen? But the answer is yes. Other questions? David. Yes. Uh, David Robbins, um, Carolina's Association of Passive Trains. Um, should the likes of Selma and Wilson and Rocky Mount be a bit concerned that some of their service, which is provided by the Carolinian now, be diverted? to another location, or are we talking of um, extra service? That's an excellent question. So we are actually talking about the expansion of services, not the, not the reduction of services you know, for, for these areas. Um, the new quarter presents an opportunity to separate, to better separate freight and passenger trains. Um, there will continue to be service over the A-line through those communities that you just described. But the expansion of service that's required is going to have to be over this new line. Okay, I believe this is to you, Tanya, or Greg. Are businesses out of the state who are certified in North Carolina allowed to work on the project? And do you anticipate the usual 15 page RFP? It's great you can take that. Yes, I probably oh. Okay, there we go. Uh, I would say no matter what state you're in, if, even with our current RFPs, um, any state that you're in, if, if you're registered here, if you're pre-qualified in North Carolina, if you have licenses here, uh, if your firm is licensed with our board, 
um, then then you would you would be eligible. And as far as 15 page, um, I guess that's Rail's decision. Historically, it's been 15 pages. Uh, is that correct, Mr. Stroop? Yes. Uh, so pro probably we would continue in that direction. Now, given that we've got <coughs> excuse me 10 contracts per per RFP, um, I, we may have to redress that. popular today. Okay, are Virginia certified DBE SB firms allowed to pursue projects in Virginia even if they are not certified in North Carolina? So we have to defer to um, Tanya on that or even Virginia. I just wanted to address the question. I had a few on the certifications. <coughs> And so, Benny Sloan, if you can work your way up for a minute as well, he's our certification manager. I think we had several and I had a few texts about certification. So DBE certification is different than the small business certification. DBE is a federal certification. In our state, we are the UCP. So if you are DBE certified in Virginia, we can get you DBE certified in North Carolina. Benny, you can go ahead and work your way up. I'm not going to let him sit down because he has all the technical answers on the certification process. Come on, keep going up. <laughs> He's a little shy. <laughs> the state certification, the SBE and the SBSF alike, um, that's a North Carolina certification um, specific. It is not a federal certification, state specific. So do you want to talk about the residency and some of the quick qualifications? I think the questions are rising because there's many firms who are out of state who want to participate in projects here in North Carolina. Good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, if you want, if you're in Virginia then, and you're DBE certified and you work in North Carolina, there's a process called interstate certification. And so we basically take your certification that's in Virginia and we review it and so that way you will be interstate certified in North Carolina. And then vice versa, if, you were in, if you're in North Carolina, and you want to work in Virginia, your North Carolina certification in Virginia with a VDOT will look at yours and do interstate certification as well. So that answers that question. Now, so you can do both federal and state projects. Whereas uh, she did allude to the SBE is uh, SBE uh, state specific only. Any other questions on certifications? Can you, also, can you also add as well, as far as there is a difference between the small business pro a program where you have the general contracting license and the bonding wage. Because um, I think there were some questions on if the business has to be situated in North Carolina. Right, that's correct. Uh, the, the SBE program, um, which NCDOT has, is more um, specific for smaller contracts, usually after uh, a lot of times maintenance. They would have those contracts that also there is. They're starting to open up some construction projects now. And those are, as she said earlier, used to be 500000 but now the valuation has improved to a million dollars. And with those contracts, if you're SBE certified, a lot of times the um, general contract and license is uh, waived and bonding is waived as well. But I do have my um, technical services director here, not on the SBSF program. That is not waived on that program, just the SBE program. Does that answer all the questions on that? Okay, do you think I heard it? Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yes. Hey, you briefly, you briefly mentioned uh, oversight firms. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what the scope of those firms might be and if they are part of those two RFPs that you talked about? Let me make sure I understand. Over, you said oversight programs. Um, was that part of the OCR presentation? No, it was uh, Troy. Okay, Troy, you want to speak to that? Sorry. A lot of content. So what was the specific question on the oversight firms? I want to make sure I get this 100% right. Uh, I, heard a, I heard somebody mention that the oversight firms were going to be selected and they might be conflicted out for design on certain segments, right? If it's the same segment. Correct. Um, so I just want to hear a little bit more about what the oversight firm might do and how they might be selected, whether they're part of those two RFPs that were uh, four segments in North Carolina, six in Virginia. 
Yeah, correct. So that's going to be a part of the RFP. Um, you know, you'll be able to, the firms will be able to either go after the oversight role, um, which may be um, one oversight firm for North Carolina and Virginia, or one in each state that's yet to be determined. Um, and in that role, they are going to be acting as an extension of NCDOT and VPRA and reviewing everything that comes back from the 30% design. Um, that's why if you're an oversight firm acting as an extension of um, the owner, NCDOT or VPRA, you can also be a, a part of that review of the uh, design products that come from the 30%. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Just a follow up on that, Troy. Is that, are you saying that you're gonna do the advertisement for the uh, LSC or oversight at the same time as the other RFPs? Best intention, yes. Um, just the thought, oh, and I mean, you guys have probably already thought about it, but of course there may be firms that fall out from the LSC that then may want to have an opportunity to go after the RFP or vice versa. So just as an opportunity to give you more input, more opportunity for more firms to participate, staggering it could be something that you guys consider again. You know, no, that's a great point, and we'll take that into consideration. Thank you. Okay, no um, the other question I had was just a point of clarification about uh, certification requirements. If North Carolina is the procurement entity for opportunities in North Carolina and Virginia, since it's North Carolina that's putting that procurement out, the DBEs that are Virginia certified going after Virginia work, they would be, have the clear right away because they're already certified in Virginia, even though the procurement itself is being administered by NCDOT. I'm gonna defer to Greg on that one. <coughs> And this may be partly Tonya's as well. Um, but as far as DBE goes, that, that'll be more for the construction side. Um, but yeah, the procurement stuff will happen here in North Carolina. But as we mentioned in the slides earlier, uh, the Virginia aspect is still being worked out. We, we've got to have some lawyers talk that out uh, because our processes are based on North Carolina law. And that obviously doesn't include Virginia. Um, so I'm told that we're still waiting to see how that turns out for the Virginia procurement. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And if I can add, uh, Mr. Lancaster, this has also been a new opportunity for us with a DBE program. So we will also get further information. Um, the great thing about being innovative is that we've created new opportunities for two different states. And so we will have to explore, um, since North Carolina is the home state, all of the procurement will apply based on North Carolina laws as well as the certification program. So if you are completely a Virginia-based company seeking opportunities, as uh, Mr. Sloan said, we can work on interstate certification. Um, but please reach out to our office if you're in that scenario you want to bid, um, and we can make sure we work with our federal highway counterparts to make sure we're in compliance and you also have that opportunity. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay, got several new questions, so that this is heating up on me here. Um, point of clarification, I think we can go back to the uh, appropriate slide on this is interesting going back to the roadway design slide and how we're procuring that and I, I have a follow-up on the uh, oversight consultant question as well but if we go to the roadway slide a lot of slides there probably is here we go okay Right, so I think there was, there's actually, there was another follow-up question here on this um, to make sure that it was clear what we had here. So we have on the roadway side, and again, I think this goes to the question about oversight versus um, sort of uh, the, the 
project design consultants, if you will. Um, there will be 11 LSC contracts for the uh, oversight role on roadway. And then thir uh, 32 RFP, or 32 contracts that would be selected through an RFP process on roadway. And then, um, can you bring up the rail sliders as well? Yes, we'll slide back. All right, let me see if I can do it. There we go. Okay. Um, rail, rail design, similar point, um, and a point of clarification. There is a limited services contract here that would be for the oversight role on rail design. That's obviously a small component here with several RFPs for the, um, the project design uh, element. Um, I think I answered that one. I'm going to go to the next question here. Uh, and I believe, Ron, this is for you. So if you could walk up here, it would be great. Uh, will the NEPA teams lead on teaming, or are you looking for a separate strategy across the corridor or even by state? That's a good question. As far as the screening, uh, the first part of our effort, that's going to be pretty consistent across the board. Uh, and the scopes of the screening should be exactly the same. When we get to the reevaluations, they may take somewhat different forms. So, um, you know, they, they may look a little bit different. And I guess what we'll, we'll be working closely with FRA to find out what those requirements are, because at the end of the day, what we want to do is to uh, satisfy FRA, uh, making them uh, comfortable with the decisions that were made in the ROD and kind of validate those decisions. So uh, as far as the reevaluations, they may look a little different and uh, the scopes of it may be slightly different. Thanks, Ron. I think the important thing there is that the screening effort is the initial effort, and uh, because the NEPA reevaluation effort is a follow-on effort that will parallel this, but is not currently in the scope of of the current contract, that will that is that is an effort that we're developing, but will but will provide another opportunity for firms with those that expertise and those those what quali those qualifications to do that work. I think I've got everything up to date so far. Other questions? David. Thank you, Jason. Uh, David Wilcock, BHB. I want to go back to the point about breaking the card up into these 10 segments. How, what do you anticipate the design scope of work to be in the segments? Will it be everything rail infrastructure related? Track, bridges, culvert stations? Or are you splitting up, splitting up some of this work by discipline as well? I'm going to ask Matthew Simmons to come up as deputy director to address that question. Um, oh my gosh, the mic was different from where I was expecting. Um, you know, the net takeaway is yes, right? The intent is all 10 may not be comprehensive in scope. Like some of the 10 could be, um, well, signals is not listed here, I don't think. But signals is going to be outside of it. But otherwise, yeah, we're breaking it down into segments, and the whole thing for rail design is going to be in each segment. So you have that. Um, one other clarification I'm just going to make and step back. Um, when it says LSC, and that's true on roadway or on rail, that's talking about using our existing rail division LSCs that already exist. And I think that may have just been misstated slightly, but um, those LSCs. Uh, will either be the rail project delivery LSC that exists or the rail crossing safety LSC that exists. So on those, those will be existing LSCs. Um, we'll select amongst the LSCs, picking basically the best team we think from the LSCs we already have. When it says RFP, um, that's a rail, I mean, that's a rail division and I think sometimes PSMU, DOT wide shorthand. Um, what that really means is, right, is we're going to specifically advertise for this project um, we did say there's going to be one. I think 
just a point of clarification, all of this is really, Jason said this at the beginning, I think Greg said it again, it's still under discussion. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly what the right rules are in order so that we can make sure we are doing as much as we can to make both sure both North Carolina and Virginia we're meeting the intent, we're trying to be inclusive. Um, what I actually expect to happen is probably two RFPs for rail, one in Virginia, even though it'll be DOT doing it, North Carolina DOT doing it, one in Virginia and one in North Carolina. So that if you are only registered in North Carolina and you have no interest in ever being a Virginia PE, um, I don't know, you had a uh, hit and run in Richmond. Obviously that wouldn't work. Um, but whatever, right? Um, in that case, uh, you're on the run from uh, Virginia State Cops. You don't have to, right? We'll let you work in North Carolina. Uh, you're, you're getting away with it, so whatever. Um, right. But, uh, but the same thing, right? If you're in Virginia and that's where you want to work, you're in Richmond, you don't really want to come down and study a segment in Raleigh, you may have to be certified, licensed in North Carolina to be pre-qualified, right? I guess we can't have had a hit and run in Raleigh. I don't know. But the intent is um, to hopefully allow you to work either place you want to work. Um, so I think that's the intent of the RFPs. So there will probably end up being two for each discipline type. But yeah, they're going to be turnkey teams. Um, for every RFP, we're going to be looking for turnkey, turnkey teams. and. It may not be required under the initial contract, but let me go ahead and tell you, when we do it, um, we're gonna be uh, judging based on how turnkey they are. Like the initial scope is probably, not probably, it will be preliminary engineering, because that's all we have funded. We can't give you an initial scope to do final design. On the other hand, even though preliminary engineering isn't gonna include detailed hydro design, right, or detailed structure design, it may include preliminary structure, right? Um, or it may or may not include geotech. That's one of those things in scope that, and budget that we still need to figure out. Um, because, you know, we do actually have to fit it within this program budget. Um, having geotech on your team, wet, regardless of whether it's in the preliminary scope or not, is important because if you don't have that, we can't extend that team to give us final design later. So I, I think that sort of ties to what you were, I think, asking. I yes. hope it answers it and hopefully yeah. it clarifies a couple other things that just, I don't know if they weren't clear or whatever, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. No, that, thank, thank you, Matthew, that, that does answer the question. And Jason, if I may, a, re, a related question to the rail design work, <coughs> excuse me, and, and the signals being handled separately by, by CSX, most likely. Um, how do you anticipate during the 30% the design process handling the operational aspects of the car to, um, double track passing sidings, you mentioned station sidings or freight bypasses. How do you, is that pretty much set in your mind how you're going to do that or is there still kind of open question about operations and how it all fits in as part of the design process? And if so, is that being handled by the oversight uh, firms, if you will, for the corridor or are the individual designers going to get involved? Excellent questions, David. Um, so to the first point, um, on the S line portion of the corridor, we're not anticipating CSX doing the signal design. Um, and that is because it will be a publicly owned corridor with its own uh, set of design criteria and standards. And we, we're going to be leaning a lot on Amtrak uh, in, in some cases uh, with you know, the operational aspects and looking at some of those things for the corridor. Um, that goes also to your second point of your question. Um, there is an active effort uh, with BPRA uh, right now in Amtrak to kind of talk about, you know, the, um, the service development. And then uh, the follow-on from that is a, uh, an operational sort of analysis. Um, we don't anticipate that being baked into the individual quarter segments. We do anticipate that being a quarter-wide analysis. Um, that is something we're working through right now. Um, it's, but um, because it involves our partners across the border and it, and it possibly involves a larger footprint than just this quarter segment, um, that, is a, that is an analysis that would be, set, it would be outside of, um, it may be an oversight consultant role, but right now that is something that we need to do route relatively quickly to, uh, to, to make sure that the quarter is designed in accordance with, with the operational analysis. Thank you. 
Hey, yeah, I have a question about the construction aspect of the future. Sure. Has there been any thought to that delivery process or the fear of the contracts that you're that you're raising up the design or will it be further pieces broken out of that? So the short answer is yes, there has been uh, some thought about that. Um, the, as I mentioned before, the delivery method uh, is still an open, an, an open discussion. Um, and in fact, we, we intend to engage with the industry um, on, on that topic uh, specifically because it is a significant amount of work. I and mean, we're talking about a four to five billion dollar program over 10, you know, eight to 10 years. So a significant amount of work. Um, it will take us and in deliver that on any kind of speed. We'll need to look at some methods that actually work. Um, that may be the combination. So to answer your question, it may or may not be fall along exactly the breakpoints of, of design, depending upon how we um, we ultimately de determine to deliver it. But that pro that thought process has been uh, baked into how we're breaking up the current segments. Thank you very much, everybody. Wow, that was like, Jason loves to nerd out on rail, so you all just like made his day, I can't even tell you. <laughs> and how impressive is our state's rail director and his team? I mean, if everybody could do another meeting, I mean, they're who just said it on this team but I wrote it down because it was so well said when you do innovative things you got to figure it out and that really resonated Tony you said it right because that's what we do in the modes we do really innovative things and the cool thing about that is you got to figure it out like you're the first to do it to bring the two states together the way we're doing this and to have the trust of our partners in Virginia and our team is really neat and really innovative and I think it's going to make for a better project and it's part of our story it's something that really interests the FRA and USDOT to see a corridor that crosses states coming together like this. It's part of, again, that secret sauce this, that makes this project so successful. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming today. Um, you are our partners that are going to get this done for us, and so we really appreciate your interest um, and your questions, and we hope you'll keep them coming. Um, thank you to VPRA and to Mike and his team for making the trip here. We really appreciate it. Um, and we appreciate the partnership enormously. Um, thank you to our partners at Amtrak, who I think are listening along because I've seen some text. So thank you to Amtrak um, and to the FRA um, and to all of our um, peers at the DOT who joined us today. Um, I really appreciate the, the partnership that we have among our peers at DOT. Um, thank you to the cities and counties, I know some of whom are here today. Um, as we continue to um, pursue our grants and build this corridor out, we're counting on you to embrace the partnerships that Tanya presented here today. It is a really important opportunity to bring our small businesses and our minority firms um, along with us on this ride. As we apply for more federal grants, that is a really important part of our story. So I really want to drive home Tanya's presentation and ask you to think about ways that you can do those partnerships to make our future asks even stronger. Um, and I hope that um, we've given you the information you need to be ready. We've taken some pictures today. You may have seen us from up here of all of you because those photos will become a part of our next grant ask because we will be saying to the FRA, North Carolina is ready. Look at our partners. Look how many showed up. Look who are, who are ready to go to deliver this program. You can have confidence in us. Uh, so we hope that you will carry that message forward with us. Um, and we appreciate your coming today. And I'm happy uh, the team will be around. If you want to answer any questions after or send them emails after, you can find all of their emails on our DOT website. So feel free to follow up. And thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you.